uh, on behalf of uh, team yogastha and iit bombay i welcome you all i welcome you dr shirley tellus so um, we've been engaged with the celebration of yoga week at iit bombay for the first time and today's lecture on applications of yoga by dr shirley tellus is an would be an enlightening lecture uh and for this uh, i would request professor ashish pande uh to come to the dais and give an introduction about international day of yoga and about dr shirley tellus introduction of yoga is a not a simple task i am sure as many of you would have attended a movie on history of yoga how many of you have attended the history of yoga movie the movie so 6000 years of the documented history the existing documents we don't know because the, the, the dates and associated events uh keep changing and they are changing very fast of late <laughs> so uh, at least in the existing documented it sees the 5000 years old practice which is aimed at spiritual mental and physical physical well being uh why 21st june as a yoga day uh because of the because 21st june is the summer solstice as an international this is a summer solstice uh and that makes the day special uh another interesting thing is that when this proposal was mooted uh 176 countries actually supported it the single resolution supported by so many countries and the supporters were uh india actually proposed and uh, it was co actually co sponsored by usa canada and china uh, so this is at least one thing in the world heritage which we can call the truly shared wisdom of humanity of civilization and uh, uh, though it it took so many years to get it recognized and when all sort of days were invented and uh, promoted and marketed including world toilet day yoga day finally is here uh, and uh, so that's a uh, that's a recognition of this great wisdom tradition and it's also in a way supports inspires make people informed to carry out these practices and uh, realize the real benefits it is starts apparently it starts with physical benefits but most of you know that the the impact and manifestation of yoga is much beyond physicality uh, it is deeply connected to our interiority which is also expressed in our uh, physical uh, characters characteristics as well as psychological characteristics uh, it's a great pleasure to have dr shirley talish uh, giving this address on the eve of uh, yoga day uh dr tellis is an inspiring researcher one of the lead researcher in the field of yoga in the world and in india her accomplishment in research in yoga are unparalleled she completed mbbs and su su uh, subsequently mphil and phd in neurophysiology from the national institute of mental health and neurosciences that is nimhans in bangalore uh Dr Dellis is a director of research at Patanjali Research Foundation Haridwar currently she also was the head of the Indian ICMR center for advanced research in yoga and neurophys neurophysiology and uh, she has co-authored more than 150 papers so many books and conducting uh, very very important research projects and guide to hundreds of other researchers in india and abroad so really welcome dr tellis for being here amongst us now may i request the dean student affairs professor mukherjee to present a souvenir to dr tellis and then we would request dr tellis to deliver her lecture on applications of yoga in daily life from a research based perspective <laughs> 
Uh, on behalf of IP Bombay. It uh, really is an honor to felicitate someone who practices her science in daily life. And I, uh, Professor Pandey, I forgot to mention, I mean, or it did not come to his notice, that as academics, we rely very heavily on uh, citations and uh, H factor. She has a H factor of 41, which is no mean feat, given that, <laughs> given that uh, you know, uh, she does a research in not a very Western sort of research area. And uh, I, I saw one little line from, I think, Houston Chronicles or someplace, where uh, they are saying that uh, Dr. Tellis talks about plasma cytokines and pl uh, pranayama at the same breath. I think we are going to have a very, very interesting lecture here. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Shirley Tellis uh, to come to the dais and deliver her lecture on applications of yoga in daily life from a research-based perspective. Okay, so it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here among all of you. I consider myself very lucky to be among this group of academicians and intellectuals on the day before International Day of Yoga. In the next few minutes, I would tell you a bit about our research on how we have tried to apply yoga in daily life. So let's see what techniques have been used to study yoga through the years, not just in our lab, but the world over. Some techniques are relatively very new, like brain imaging, functional magnetic resonance imaging, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which tells you in real time in sp with very good spatial and temporal localization where changes are occurring in the brain. But there are also techniques shown to the left, lower left end of the slide, which allow you to see changes at the cellular level. And these are all fairly recent. For example, can yoga influence the genes so that the telomere length does not change and uh, aging is delayed? But these are new techniques. What about older techniques? Qualitative analysis. Techniques such as introspection, observation, they are very important. And why are they important? The answer is the best yoga researchers that there have ever been in the history of yoga research used these techniques. The question is, who were these yoga researchers? The answer is, they were the ancient sages and rishis of India. Their body and minds were their laboratories and they observed what uh, changes were occurring in them and pass them on to us either through word of mouth or etchings as you can see on palm leaves. And because of that we have today certain the documentation which is dyed in so many other ancient cul cultures available to us about what happens when you practice yoga. Now the next question that I'm going to ask is, is it possible to test some of the observations of these great sages in the lab? So we'll look at pranayamas first. Then I'm just going to cite one example of certain pranayamas or yoga breathing techniques. These involve breathing through one nostril at a time, that is right uninostral breathing, left uninostral breathing, or alternate nostril breathing. Before coming to the present day contemporary scientific findings, let's see what the ancient texts had to say. The ancient text that I'm going to talk, quote is the Swara Yoga text. The origin of this is so old that its origin is really lost in antiquity. It's probably more than uh, 10,000 years old. What does it say? It's very interesting that when air flows through the left nostril, one should do peaceful things. And you, it is interesting to note that among peaceful activities is included obtaining nourishment. So eating while running or eating while doing work was not thought of in those days, collecting grain and so on. When air was flowing through the right nostril, then people were told to do active activities, energizing. And you can see it's interesting that they've included studying there because the brain really uses 20% of all the energy in the body, journeying 
and of course because it was old very old controlling an elephant <clears throat> so now what do we find in the lab what if one practices right uni nostril breathing inhalation and exhalation through the right nostril exclusively what do we find the answer is i've summarized it here and these are a combination of studies done through the years the oxygen consumption or the calories burnt increase and rightly right uni nostril breathing is called a heat generating or surya anuloma viloma pranayama because it really burns the calories and you can really prove this in the lab the downside of it as a weight loss technique is it increases the blood pressure but this is in keeping in a way with what was described in the ancient texts because it's energizing and so we suggest applications like using it for young people who are obese people who are a little slow in learning because it stirs up the brain and the same works for certain kinds of depression on the other hand what happens with left nostril breathing here you see the symbol of the moon because it's called chandra anuloma viloma anuloma viloma means inhale and exhale and chandra is of course the moon this is supposed to be cooling and that was the definition in swara yoga texts and here we see that it lowers the blood pressure reduces insomnia and reduces anxiety these are um, studies which we have published if you would like any i'd be happy to send them to you the my email is on the first slide and it would be available on the computer here so it's interesting that there is a correlation between swara yoga text written 5000 years ago and what we find at the laboratory even today let's move forward and see alternate nostril breathing these are the applications so the alternate nostril breathing is interesting because it appears to increase balance according to the ancient texts now let's see what we find we particularly found one consistent finding with alternate nostril breathing and that is that alternate nostril breathing really increases the ability to perform tasks which actually raise the blood pressure without raising them so that's very useful in hypertension it lowers the blood pressure in people who are hypertensive this is a consistent finding not just from our laboratory but from a laboratory which is studying uni nostril and alternate nostril breathing in um, la in uh, it's not ucla it's a private organization in los angeles apart from that we have an ongoing study to look at coherence between the left and right brain which is very important to balance because the left left brain is what we exert in our in most of our studies nowadays maths science and so on very rarely do we uh, that's what you see in red but very rarely do we tap our right brain emotional creative artistic aesthetic so that's the part which is often uh, neglected as was described by the nobel prize winner who did the split brain experiment roger sperry and if there is an imbalance between the left and right brain you can get conditions like schizophrenia manic depressive psychosis and so on so alternate nostril breathing and balancing the two halves is one of the projects we are currently carrying on but now let's move on from pranayamas to meditation over the years we have studied a number of meditation techniques i put them up here listed and we find there are many common features between them for example meditation can be described very interestingly uh, this was first mentioned for transcendental meditation as a state of alertful rest so the body is actually behaving almost as if the person is very alert as if they are writing an exam but the brain is as if they are deep in deep sleep such a incongruous combination in a way it differs from many other conditions like when a person takes say psychedelic drugs because sensory perception is better more accurate whereas if a person takes lsd for example their sensory perception totally is distorted and physiological arousal is lower and yet they are alert what's the effect of meditation on sleep this is something that we studied with whole night that is uh, we put get the person in the laboratory at around 9 in the night and record till 7 am 
with EEG, EMG, and EOG, and there's a standard sleep stage scoring. For this, we have to ask the basic question, what are the types of sleep? So as we go into sleep, there is light sleep. At that time, if someone calls your name out loud, you definitely wake up, or even if there's a loud sound, or someone switches on the light. And light sleep is not at all refreshing. Then after that, there is deep sleep. Deep sleep is when children grow, and after the age of growth, when adults have regeneration and repair. The growth hormone is secreted at the time, and it's a very important hormone in our body. The third type of sleep is REM sleep, R-E-M, rapid eye movement, where dreams occur. Now, what's the function of dreams? Everyone get, usually gets excited thinking about this. I'm not going to talk about the Freudian theory, but what is the current uh, view in neurophysiology? In REM sleep, the, the dreams which occur are illogical. So you could be sitting here in your dream <clears throat> and um, listening to me talking, and then you could suddenly be flying, or you could be in a place where you were in your childhood. So there's no logic there. And why does this happen? What is the importance of this illogical uh, thought pattern which occurs during dreams? This happens so as to erase like a blackboard duster or whiteboard duster unnecessary memories which we may accumulate during the day. For example, all of us may have glanced at this, the seat, color of the seats in this hall, they're brown, and the carpet. And this is an unnecessary memory. So if we accumulate many such unnecessary memories, our brain gets filled with them. And we need something to actually obliterate the unnecessary memories every night. And that's the function of REM sleep. Because the thought functioning is erratic. It acts like a duster to remove such uh, unnecessary memories. What is the effect of meditation? It's interesting to note that while it improves slow wave sleep, which is a good sign, it decreases REM sleep. So we are a little concerned. Does that mean that memory would worsen? So far, we have not found that with our studies on meditation, but it's worth looking into. It also reduces arousal. So the quality of sleep generally is much better in people who meditate. That's how they can often wake up early in the morning and so on and still be refreshed throughout the day. So in conclusion, if we look at pranayamas and meditation, we can say that what is shown in the ancient texts can be proven to some extent in the laboratory today. And having done this, we can move on to applying yoga in daily life. We look particularly to begin with at two applications, very important school children, but that can be extrapolated to students of any age and adult office workers who face stress at the workplace, which is applicable, I think, to all of us. So the first study was done uh, very close to our institution. You can see we're right up in the north of India. Uh, it was published in 2013. Now, this was a randomized control trial where we had preteen children, that is, they were 10 to 13, uh, under 10, 13 years of age, 10 to 12 and a half years of age, um, 90 of them randomized as two groups, 45 in a yoga group, 45 in a physical exercise group, and we followed them up for three months. Uh, they were assessed at baseline for physical fitness using the Eurofit fitness battery, which measures about tw uh, 12 aspects of physical fitness. We uh, looked at cognitive functions using a very a routinely used test, that is Stroop task. We also looked at their academic performance, their behavior in class, behavior with peers, behavior with the teachers, and so on. <clears throat> now, let me show you a picture first of the two groups. What are the differences between yoga and physical exercise? I always like to emphasize there are three differences. Yoga requires awareness. So you can run on a treadmill, and you can watch something on a uh, TV, or you can listen to music in, from your uh, on an iPod or whatever. But you can't do that with yoga. When you practice yoga, you have to go inwards. It's an inner journey. And you have to observe each and everything that's happening in your body and in your mind. Yoga should always be done in a very relaxed mental state. 
So if you try to squeeze in 10 minutes of yoga and rush to work, that doesn't work. It's better to come back in the evening and do, do it when you're relaxed. And the third and very important point is all yoga practices should be synchronized with the breath. And when we synchronize it with the breath, it's important to remember that yoga breathing always emphasizes that the exhale should be longer than the inhale. These are the three basic differences. Now, to summarize the findings, the two groups did almost comparably on all aspects on which they were tested. Physical fitness, performance in the Stroop task, behavior, academic uh, scores, and so on. There was just one difference. And that was in their self-esteem, which was assessed with a questionnaire. No other measurement at this stage. But uh, it was very clearly a difference between the two groups. And self-esteem can be so important in preteens to cope with exams, to cope with peer pressure, bullying, and so on. Well, I'll move on to yoga and stress in the workplace. So this is what happens in preteens. Let's see in adulthood. We looked at many, we've had many examples through the years, but I've picked out three, which I felt were particularly relevant here because I was asked to talk, emphasize on alertness and relaxation, which is something we all need in our work. So this is an army base in the north of India where the people are suddenly deployed for active combat, but they never know when. So they'll be there and then suddenly told one hour before, now you have to go. And it could be to the Indochina border. It could be anywhere where there's some problem occurring in the country. And in the rest of the time, they are idle. And waiting can be often more stressful than activity. So these people were getting very stressed. Some of them were getting depressed and there were even one or two suicides. So we were asked by the person who ran the, ran the center to develop a yoga module which would allow them to be alert yet relaxed. So could, this was the research question. We had 90 people, three groups, again randomized. Uh, a yoga group, classical music was the other intervention. And the third intervention was breath awareness, 30 in each group. We did, it was a seven week intervention because they were not there in this base for longer than seven weeks. And we looked at state anxiety or the anxiety that a person feels at a particular moment in time, as well as their ability to perform an attention task. The long and short of the next graphs is that they did do better after yoga in the attention task, but their anxiety reduced. So what they wanted was fulfilled. But I'd like to emphasize, when you're forming a yoga module, like you have the International Day of Yoga protocol, you need to pick out those elements which help you. So some of them may increase focusing. Some of them, so if a person is over-focused, they should not do those practices. So in a, devising a yoga module, you need a lot of thought. And that brings me to the next group, professional computer users. We had 200 of them. And uh, some of them were from the highly rated uh, in terms of performance as well as in terms of the work, out, uh, work output. Base, there is a rating given by Stanford University as well as some of, uh, of the lower rated companies. So we ensured that the two groups, 100 in each group, had an equal mix from high rated company and lesser rated companies. Now, the first thing we found that irrespective of the type of company, many of them were taking over-the-counter anti-anxiety medication, which was a cause of real problem, uh, worry for us. Because in India, if you just go to a chemist, you can get anti-anxiety medication. This is a real problem in our country. So we uh, gave them yoga for two months, one group, and the other group were allowed to do whatever they did in their 45 minutes of recreation. And incidentally, most of them sat in the cafeteria and just talked to their friends and did whatever they wanted. Well, the yoga group had definite benefits in terms of less anxiety, less manifestations of stress on the body in, to, in terms of digestive disturbances, uh, allergies, and so on, less of dry eye syndrome or computer vision syndrome, musculoskeletal, which could range right from back pain right up to discomfort 
at the wrist and even carpal tunnel syndrome. These are the journals in which we published it. And more recently, we had a totally different profession, less paid but very important, primary school teachers. We had 450 of them at our center in Haridwar from a northeastern state. And they said that they were very stressed because the classrooms were crowded, their salaries were low, and there was a lot of strain on their voice because they would be talking all the time. There were insufficient teachers. So they, these were their problems. At the end of 14 days, we did find that we could not only reduce their stress, but also improve their overall lung capacity so that their voice would carry better. And this is one of the strong benefits with yoga practice. So we move on. from. So we've seen ch children, adults, and now we look at seniors or a geriatric population. These, live, uh, these people were living in a home. There were 69 selected out of an original number of 128. These 69 people were all healthy and their ages ranged from 60 to 94. It was a three-armed random, randomized control trial, yoga, Ayurveda, and weightlist control. And we had to do, obviously, age-wise stratified sampling. We, the long and short of it, you'll see the next slide has the yoga in progress, is that there were a number of improvements in the yoga group. And some of them were also seen with Ayurveda, but not so clearly. What were the improvements? Mainly, they all, most of them had high levels of depression. They felt that after retirement, they were worthless. Many of them felt that they had been deserted by their children and so on. Their quality of sleep was poor. They'd wake up in the night and stay awake. Many of them uh, were unsteady in walking. And this is often a very big problem because if old people fall, then that's often the beginning of the end. They're bedridden and they are no longer functional. Memory which is very important. Lung functions deteriorated in the control group, but remain same in the yoga group. So lung functions normally deteriorate with age. So it sort of helped deter prevent the natural deterioration. What about extreme circumstances like uh, PTSD or natural calamities? So that we come to next. There was one such calamity in 2004 Boxing Day, that is the day, uh, December 26th, the day after Christmas. Uh, and was, we were, where the uh, Indonesia, the whole of that belt, Sri Lanka, the eastern coast of India was totally devastated. And we particularly bad were the Andaman Islands, which are, as you all know, are in the Bay of Bengal. So we went there a month later, that is on January 26th, Republic Day. And this paper has been published, but I've not put the reference. But what I wanted to say there is two things. These people were terribly anxious. They, uh, their manifestation of post-traumatic stress disorder was that the very sight of the sea would make them shiver or cry. And that was one of the, stra uh, um, the manifestations because the disaster was so sudden. And with 10 days of yoga intervention, this anxiety came down. The other point I wanted to make is that in the Andaman Islands, there were two types of people. Mainland settlers, people who had gone from India to settle there, as well as the tribal people, indigenous. Many of them were Negroid or Mongolian in their nature. And we found that the, Mongo the tribal people had better coping strategies. So this is one reason why possibly it is good to let people retain their indigenous uh, customs. Because if we try to replace it with present day coping strategies, sometimes those strategies are not so good. On the other hand, we had another example of disasters. The Koshi River in Bihar overflows each year when there is a monsoon. These people are displaced. They go and stay in a tent. And unlike the people in the Andaman Islands, their post-traumatic stress disorder manifested as extreme apathy and sadness, depression. They said there's absolutely nothing going to happen to us. No one is going to take any, bring, there were lots of people rushing to the aid of the, the people in the Andaman Islands. There was no one here. 
<clears throat> they said, we don't know what's going to happen to us. So we had to give them a specific yoga module to shake them out of their apathy. And it did happen. And that's what we published in BMC Psychiatry. And it's very specific for sadness compared to anxiety. So that's the point I wanted to highlight. So yoga can be used as a therapy, as we've seen. It can be used to promote positive health, prevent disease. And I'm going to emphasize that mainly. And just touch on yoga as a therapy. <clears throat> we have particularly taken up yoga for obesity because it is known that obesity is the precursor of many conditions, particularly type 2 diabetes mellitus, which has really gained epidemic proportions in our country. We have to do something about it. There is another fact as well. It is particularly associated with central obesity. In India, you often have, in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, whose limbs are normal in weight, but they have waist. The weight is only gathered around their waist. This is called central obesity or central as adiposity. And it's very dangerous. It could be either subcutaneous, just below the skin, or packed between the organs, visceral fat. Why is it dangerous? Because it's associated with coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes mellitus. It's associated with hypertension and even with cancers, breast cancer and uterine cancer in females and prostate cancer in males. So we have to do something to reduce central obesity in our country. We've got a nationwide program for this, but I'm not going to go into it. How do we think yoga acts? We did a randomized control trial where we compared uh, 45 minutes of yoga get given two times a day with 45 minutes of a comparable uh, in terms of the metabolic usage, walking. So we compared yoga with walking. Many of us go for a morning walk. So how useful is yoga compared to walking? We asked it with respect to the uh, body mass index, the waist circumference, various other measures. And almost on all measures, the two com were comparable or equal. There was just one measure where they differed. This is a chemical called leptin. Leptin is a natural appetite suppressant. It's so marvelous the way the body functions because as the fat cells in the body increase, the uh, fat cells start secreting leptin. And leptin acts on the hypothalamus in our brain and sends a signal stop eating. But unfortunately for man, we have the thinking cortex. So we can say, okay, uh, I like chocolate. So just one chocolate won't make a difference. And that's where the problem begins, where we don't listen to the signals coming from our body. So let's see, particularly the change was actually between yoga and walking in leptin. Both of them increase the leptin levels. But as you see, the significant change, and this is ANOVA with a post-hoc analysis, uh, was in the yoga group. That's what you see on the left side, uh, light blue bar. But with walking as well, there was an increase in leptin. Now, what's the function of leptin apart from suppressing appetite? It helps us to make healthy food choices. So if you're given the food on the lower left, junk food, so to speak, I don't like to use the word because all food is food. But anyway, not so good food. Uh, you choose uh, healthy food and you choose to be hydrated. So these are some of the ways yoga promotes positive health. And many of us at the end of the day have aches and pains. We sit a long time with the computer. Can yoga do anything for that? We looked at yoga with back pain, people with back pain, where there were actually proven changes shown on a spinal MRI, <clears throat> though the changes in the MRI did not uh, alter after three months, their pain perception changed. It was as if they could tolerate pain better. So maybe that's important. <clears throat> and now I come to a, I'm almost coming to the end really because we'll leave time if there is for discussion. Uh, how important is theory to yoga practice? Is it only the asanas, the pranayama, the kriyas? the meditation? Or should we read the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita? Should we read Patanjali's Yoga Sutras? We had 300 people. 
well, we had 420 people who came to our institution for stress management. 300 of them agreed to participate in a trial where we randomized them as two groups, 150 in each group. One group had only theory derived, as I said, from the Bhagavad Gita, certain Upanishads, from the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, these three. And the other group had only practice. And we measured only the state anxiety because it was a large sample that we were handling. The gist of the next graph that I'm going to show is that both groups improved. It's published as well. But the improvement was slightly more when we had practice compared to theory. But this shows the importance of theory in yoga. The ways of managing stress which are described in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are so uh, incomparable really. Present day uh, workshops on stress cannot compare with them. I'm not going into those details for, because I wanted to keep to the time. Uh, I'm happy to say <clears throat> that last week we released a book, three authors from the US, one, the Safir Khalsa, the person with the turban and the beard, is a uh, faculty at uh, Harvard, uh, the uh, Lorenzo Cohen from MD Anderson Cancer Center, Timothy McCall, who's a general practitioner and uh, author of a book, Yoga as Medicine, and myself. Uh, it's a book where there are 23 chapters with theory describing the rationale for using yoga, the research and practice. So it's the first thing, chapter where we have. 60 contributors from all over the world, 30 yoga therapists. And the only yoga modules that we've included are not uh, from a single school. The only criteria is they, sh they should have been proven to be efficacious based on evidence or research, published research. So this is the book we released a week ago. And uh, across the world, and in India particularly, these are some of the conditions addressed which can be managed successfully through yoga, including in infect chronic infection like tuberculosis. These are some of the references. And finally, I always like to emphasize that yoga, even if we are not talking of theory, which is still the intellect, yoga goes far beyond the physical and even beyond the intellect. It calms the mind, perhaps by drawing on our inner resources, the bhakti component, connecting with a higher source, a higher a per, divine, with the divine facts. And actually this has been published in a medical journal. And it is not, uh, though it is derived from Indian texts, if you want to call them Hindu texts, but it is a science which can be applicable and can be practiced by everyone. Uh, and that's why we have this symbol here from the Star of David, Judaism, through all other forms of beliefs in spirituality. So with that, I'll end and say thank you. So gave us a new perspective uh, for, I mean, looking at yoga from a different angle altogether. Now, um, now we'll have the question answer session and may I request Professor Varadraj Bapat to come to the dais and moderate the session, please. Uh, I would request the audience to please feel free and ask the questions, uh, anything related to the lecture or you, uh, whatever comes to your mind uh, from, uh, from uh, yoga as a science perspective. There is no need to really moderate. I would request you all to start asking questions. How are the stress levels measured? And uh, how accurately will we be able to say that this has been lowered? This has been lowered? Right. Normally, when, when there is stress in the body, when there's a, a person is faced with a stressful situation, there are classically two responses, fight or flight. And that is when the sympathetic nervous system, the, uh, the, sim the system which causes our blood pressure to rise, our heart rate to increase, everything which gears up, up to fight or flight uh, to happen. So there's a sympathetic overdrive. But it's now recognized 
that there is a third response also possible. Freeze. When some, these are all responses which are present in the animal brain. So when an animal is confronted with a stress, like something challenging an animal, an animal may fight or flee from it or freeze. Like you may have a deer confronted by a tiger trying to camouflage, uh, get among the camouflage and freeze. Freeze is also recognized to be a very dangerous response uh, because it uh, is associated with certain cancers. Now, how are fight, flight and freeze detected in the body? You can measure it through the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system with great accuracy. There are more than 20 measures uh, and a whole battery which is widely recognized as a battery for stress assessment. There are certain biochemical measures. The most typical is salivary cortisol. So you have to sample it at least two on or three times in a day. Just take a swab, put it in the mouth and you can sample the cortisol levels two or three times in a day. Very reliable because cortisol is secreted each and every time we feel stressed. And cortisol is one of the most dangerous chemicals because all the diseases you can think of could be caused potentially by cortisol. Yeah, the effects of cortisol are many. One is the effect is it increases the blood sugar. So potentially each time cortisol rises, a person could uh, have a flood of blood sugar. It's not good because the insulin would be repeatedly increasing, can lead to diabetes. It weakens the bones because it causes leaches calcium from the bone, can cause osteoporosis, um, many other effects. So it's not such a good. If exercise is done beyond the body's limits and the person is actually feeling strain or even uh, mentally and physically even feeling pushed beyond their limits, definitely they would secrete cortisol. So that's why we emphasize in yoga, a sure sign that one is not practicing correctly is if after your yoga practice, you're breathing heavily and feeling tired. After yoga, you should feel very excited and refreshed. Uh, Ma'am, what was, uh, what were the, uh, what were the measurements used as regards to the impact of the yoga uh, as a therapy on uh, on cancer? Okay, and actually, cancer has you. The, it is uh, studied right from the time of diagnosis through treatment up to long term follow up. So, at the time of diagnosis, normally what has been assessed is. In levels of anxiety, levels of depression, levels of anger. So they're more psychological measures. Then as the person moves through chemotherapy, there's a, a, a usually a, the papers which have been published have reported changes in immune measures because as chemotherapy and radiation both depress the immune system. In a radi uh, th There's another study which has looked at the effect of yoga in reducing damage caused by radiation therapy to the cells and yoga can reduce that damage. Uh, then after a person has gone through say chemotherapy, radiation and surgery, the next time is when they are in uh, survivors and they have to keep going for repeated follow up. Now during this time the person is always anxious particularly when they go to get checked. So at that time, yoga can reduce the anxiety. It can also reduce the discomfort during chemotherapy. I would say that there have been reports of regression, but the reports of regression, in my opinion, are not strong enough to say, uh, though I have observed cases, the published studies are not strong, en strong enough to say that it can cause regression. I would hesitate to say that. Probably the same principles apply across sciences. So whatever you take as your criteria to judge a research paper as good, is the sample size adequate? Have the measurements which have been used, uh, are they objective or are they subjective? Uh, are the conclusions drawn prematurely or is there adequate statistical evidence? So these are some of the questions you need to critically ask when you look at the paper. That is a very important question because in medicine, it is true. We can't make a general comment, but sometimes when it is sponsored by a company, it could be biased. So you have to read it very critically. 
to what extent yoga can help in getting rid of uh, addictions there are var- various uh, addictions so to what extent yoga can help there has been one publication i think on yeah i mean not i think there is one publication on yoga for cigarette smoking uh, it is definitely useful um they didn't even have to use nicotine patches or anything people were able to come off cigarettes through yoga with alcohol and with other substances it's much more difficult the published evidence is very sketchy it's difficult there are several organizations across the world working on it but it's very difficult generally uh the type of yoga preferred by males is different from the type of yoga preferred by females males generally preferred more vigorous practices which is uh i felt i, I mean uh, a, a byproduct maybe of testosterone whereas females like more of the um gentler practices this is one of the observations we did find uh, other than that the effects did not differ too widely nothing statistically significant but even that what i mentioned about liking more vigorous and gentler practices is just an impression we haven't compared it and proven it uh, i had would a, be interested i had a question about your uh, studies which you have done in school teachers professionals all those uh, how much component was actually pranayam and how much was asanas like you know uh, and how much time per day were they uh, it depends for each study for example for the i can give you an example particularly the computer professionals 45 minutes a day uh five days in a week for two months and out of the 45 minutes it was roughly 15 minutes for loosening exercises and asanas 15 minutes for pranayama 15 minutes for guided relaxation but since i haven't glanced at the paper oh, i may be slightly off but it included all these components and usually uh, uh children below what age should not do either pranayam or asanas because i had attended one uh, yoga class and they said very small like below 12 or something they said that their bones are still growing and so they should not perform asanas is there any study on that no the uh, there's no study to my knowledge but uh, the one thing we do say is that actually children are very flexible they won't break their bones easily but the one thing we do say is that pre pubertal children and this is an observation we had both in the bangalore center where i worked as well as in haridwar that pre pubertal children if they do inverted postures like the shoulder stand or the plow posture halasan or of course shirshasan they are more likely to get precipitate puberty early so that's uh, less de- less desirable Yeah in fact in one school in Chennai for children with special needs they start putting them in the yoga postures as early as 3 months Okay uh hi thank you for the talk it was very enlightening my question is uh adding to all the measurement questions say i'm i take up uh yoga sincerely from tomorrow how would i go about uh, measuring progress other than you know feeling good generally but how would i um i mean i obviously cannot take part in trials all the time right right so how would i personally measure progress like are there any techniques to do that yeah. or yeah one could definitely uh, on a scale you could have an analog scale 0 to 10 and rate your own sleep quality of sleep the level of uh, performance that you feel that you are able to put in work performance the level of uh, mental fatigue at the end of the day the level of um, irritation when something happens are you less irritated or more you know so there are many things whatever you would like to get from yoga put it down on a paper and make a 0 to 10 scale and see whether it's changing or not what is the role what is the role of uh, or how does uh, medicine antidepressants or anxiety medicine complement the, the practices like these breathing practices or meditation and can a person who's suffering from depression or anxiety just resort to these practices and not depend on the medicines and I mean can one solve it that way it really depends on the which disease one is talking about let's say Even, depression or anxiety no. there again one has to see which type in depression and anxiety 
there is neurotic depression and psychotic depression. Neurotic is where there is no organic change or no chemical change and the person is aware that they are depressed. Psychotic depression is where there is an organic or a chemical change in the brain and the person doesn't know they are depressed. But their people around them realize that there is something seriously wrong with them. Yoga is effective and can even be used for a while at least without uh, adding on antidepressants for neurotic depression. If it is psychotic depression, it cannot. So, in all your interventions and studies, how much emphasis did you lay on yama and niyama uh, in addition to asana and pranayama? Normally, the people, um, as I said, we, we have, what we do is, we have a philosophy of yoga. So, right at the start, when they are being introduced into the, to the yoga program, they are given a, a class which covers the yamas and niyamas. And every day, this is a suggestion we give to everyone in every yoga center. You may not have time to talk about Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or even discuss the yamas and niyamas every day. But just write on the blackboard one thought. So, at the end of the session, the person can go with a sankarp some sort of uh, resolution or resolve. So, I would say the yamas and niyamas are the obvious beginning or starting point of view. Many of them have to do with the lifestyle itself, right? Yeah, of course. Oh, there was one interesting slide about, uh, I mean, those who focused on theory and those who focused on practice. So, I have always thought that this is more about practice, though so theory is important. So, uh, could you a bit more elaborate on how much theory was important and what benefit was obtained of? See, the people had come with stress and this is the biggest, one of the biggest problems people face nowadays. So, modifying one's thought patterns can happen through practice where we secrete good chemicals or through uh, ideas which make us think differently. And in the Mm, particularly in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, there are a whole lot of thoughts or ideas. I don't have, I, 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 for a shortage of time, I haven't included that. But there are really very good tips. I can give you an example which may help everyone uh, if we are not running short of time. There's the description of what are called the stress producing factors. Five are described in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And these are considered universal for, and I believe that what was thought uh, in 1000 BC holds good even today. The first one, and I'm putting them in any order, I-ness, the sense of self. So, this is my space, someone else intrudes, you get irritated, or this is my work, someone else takes it, you get irritated, so I-ness, whatever, whichever way an intrusion into your personal space. A very strong, so uh, Raga Dvesha, strong likes and strong dislikes. Strong likes, so you like uh, a particular food and you go to a country where it is totally not available but you are posted for three months, so you have a miserable time and come back. You dislike. It's very sad if you dislike another person, but if you dislike another person and that person and you have to work together on a project for six months, it's going to be a chronic stress. So, so first, Inus likes, dislikes, then wrong knowledge. A common example which anyone can follow of this is um, if you are not too familiar with medical terms, but you go to the doctor, the doctor writes uh, the radiologist writes something on your report, you try to search it on Google and you get something very frightening and you think you have got really dreadful disease. Next day you go to the doctor and the doctor says it is nothing. So, there are very, the whole gamut, of the spectrum of wrong knowledge, the way the yogis meant it is that the everything that we are living is just a maya or an illusion. And the reality is that all this is unimportant, whether we succeed, we publish a research paper, we get a degree, we get a, a rise in our salary, we don't get a rise. All this is just momentary and transient. 
the true reality is far beyond that. So that is wrong knowledge if we think this is the reality. So that is one example is a simple day to day example. The other is the way it is meant in yoga. And the fifth and last is fear. So sometimes we are fearful of losing our position, fearful of losing our fame, fearful of losing our possessions. We always give an example, I think in most yoga centers I've heard people say, you get a new car, you're very proud of it, then it gets scratched and your whole day is spoiled. So fearful. So you get something, you're, there's always the fear of loss. So these five factors, Iness, strong likes, strong dislikes, wrong knowledge and fear. Fear of death is the ultimate. So if we have, do a, this is just one example of how theory can alter our thinking patterns. So when you feel a strong dislike coming up, that's the time we have to just tell ourselves, yeah, try to go easy with it, try to leave it behind. There is one from Esriasa itself, from this Bangalore institution, where they tried to look at uh, sattvic food and rajasic food and how people behaved. I'm not sure if it's got published, but I know there was a study at some stage. Ma'am, uh, there are seven ch chakras in the body. Is there any research on that? Hmm. They exist? Yeah, there was a person, there has been a person in Japan called Motoyama, is his name, I think. Motoyama. Uh, Maybe, who invented a chakra machine, but it's not very acceptable. Normally, the sampling is done twice a day. The limit ideal would have been to do it four times, but the limitation is obviously the cost of doing it, and also the nuisance to the patient and everything. So, oh yeah, of course. I mean, the spike in the morning and the, the, the change towards evening. So that is known. So in order to take care of that, uh, it is sampled twice a day. I just quote one of our own books. This book actually, the main editor is, uh, uh, is uh, no, from Harvard and the second one, yeah. So it's a combination. I would like to emphasize that everything in this is based on evidence. So uh, it's like a textbook, basically. Because only those things which have been actually not just published but are of a certain level of rigor are included here. So this is one book which we are now, the government, uh, when we had a meeting at the uh, Press Bureau of India on the 8th of June in Delhi, um, they particularly have asked me uh, questions about this book and can it be made available to medical colleges and medical hospitals in India an Indian edition which is cheaper. So uh, like this, it's not just this book because I happen to be involved in it. There are books coming out which are talking about evidence-based yoga. Unfortunately, very few of them are coming, not, not even one is coming out from India. All are coming from other countries. <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of the questions. That as long as we don't strain ourselves. What happens if you do it Yeah. If one, yeah, if it is, if it is not strain, if there's no mental and physical strain, there may be a slight increase in the cortisol levels to make the blood sugar more available and various other changes. But if the person is experiencing actual strain, it is strenuous. They actually have physical pain. Then. They would, the level of rise, the increase, the magnitude of rise in cortisol would be much higher. Could be not, could be not. I, I mean, a, a, a person who's doing accustomed to it, there would be cardiovascular, the cardiorespiratory system would be efficient and meet the oxygen requirements, and they would not feel, in fact, their body may feel good, the endorphins will be secreted and they'll feel happy actually. I wanted to ask regarding Anulom Vilom and this uninostral breathing. Was it tried in special children and other children and how much time in a day they were asked to do? Okay. We've tried uh, right uninostral breathing in children with Down syndrome because they're usually a little overweight and also they're very pleasant but they're a little 
uh, dull. So it's difficult to make them concentrate. So how much time? Uh, they are given 27 rounds, where one round is inhale, exhale, three times in a day. And what you said about uninostral breathing in day-to-day -day life for decreasing anxiety and all, that you advise normal adult for how much time? Again, 27 rounds, three times a day. But if a person is not, say, not able to get sleep, at least two, five or six minutes before going to sleep. Uh, not specifically on you know, but an integrated approach of yoga therapy was done long back. Yeah, uh, there's a study in 1989, long back, um, where they showed uh, improvement in psychomotor coordination, intellectual uh, functioning did not deteriorate, whether, whereas it deteriorated in the control group. And their social interaction, interaction with peers, teachers, was better. Like, is there any restriction on how many breaths per minute? Uh, ideally, well, our breath rate should be around 12. Excuse me. I have one question. Have you analyzed any yogic person who is doing yoga or so meditation since long here? Uh -huh. So, have you analyzed any yogic person? Uh, who is doing yoga or meditation since long so years. So we can say that what are the changes happening in the brain or at what places it is happening oh, because yeah. he might be a right model to do that. Yeah, we have had uh, at least four such special people in our laboratory. One person was able to switch from a single thought state to a no thought state at will and we could see physiological changes. Another person was able to remain without uh, oxygen. So, you could put him in a pit and this has been studied in other places as well and we could uh, see that he was able to stay there and uh, the third, how long? <laughs> Four hours and 15 minutes. Uh, it was a collaborative effort actually with another institution and the third special practitioner and that it didn't work, claimed that he could levitate, but he never did. <laughs> these, are, I don't know, these are the examples. I you published these results or? <laughs> uh, the first one, single thought and no thought, has been published. Okay. Uh, the pit has been published by other people uh, where we collaborated, but we were not co authors on the paper. And the last one, since there was no result. Yeah. We didn't publish. <laughs> Ma'am, actually, uh, for severe migraine or uh, uh, sinus problem, this pranayam can help or if it help, uh, how much time regularly we should practice? Uh, there are many multiple practices for sinusitis and migraine. Uh, and with first this uh, problem is uh, when migraine comes severe, uh, head pain and headache and vomiting. Yeah, then it's usually one-sided. So that one should observe then is which, which nostril is blocked. So if that nostril is blocked, one should forcibly try to breathe through the nostril. This is actually not yoga, but neurology that I'm talking about. Uh, Professor Bapat, I thank you for moderating the session and thank you, Dr. Tellis for taking an extended question answer session. Uh, may I request Professor Ashish Pandey to uh, come to the dais and uh, give a vote of thanks for Dr. Tellis. It's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks, uh, Dean Faculty Affairs, Professors Swamya Mukherjee, faculty colleagues, uh, colleagues from other facilities, uh, Dr. Anapuri is here from the hospital and uh, colleagues from the other institutions. Uh, uh, first of all, I extend my uh, sincere gratitude to Dr. Tellis for very patiently interacting with us since last three and a half hours. So, because before this presentation, uh, he was, she was with the, uh, with, with few of us in the School of Management and I was sharing with her and I was always frightened with the list of publication he has had. Uh, I thought of a person who would be very introvert, not liking to interact much and all that, but she is very joyfully interacting. So, it's a really, really inspiring. Other than your research, your own being is also inspiring. So thanks very much for the way you are.
and of course for your talk and the research and the knowledge creation and dissemination you are engaged in um, i extend the uh, thanks to the institution administration because uh, they have been very very supportive of uh, these activities and that is the uh, the blessing and the support of the uh, what we call the main building we are able to organize the complete yoga week this year and i am i am not uh, i don't have any doubt that this these celebrations and these functions will always increase in terms of a scale and the depth both in years to come so thanks very much for the uh, administration uh, the the group which has been coordinating all these activities so the sarang is representative uh, divanshi is here or not she must be uh, making arrangement for the other uh, activities being planned and the whole yogast group they are engaged very sincerely for organizing the events there is a summer school of yoga going on there is a yoga than planned uh, tomorrow uh, the yoga protocol and so many activities are being planned and organized and these are all st students who are actually making it all possible so thanks very much for the yoga group for taking this initiative uh, in this room there must be lot of yoga practitioners so thanks for practicing and being here as an audience to support this event and those who are not practitioners they are definitely the curious audience so thanks for your curiosity which brought you here extend this curiosity give it more energy and bring it to the level of practice <laughs> thanks very much so there's a set of asanas or yoga practices which which will be practiced tomorrow from 7 to 8 am same place badminton hall who all have been reporting 6:45 the late comers won't be let in they, they, and uh, there would be refreshments served you will enjoy the practice who all completed yoga thon challenge last year 108 oh that's really nice we have quite a good number of people uh, so all those who completed i request you to please be there we might require you to guide the groups the small sub groups and um, who all watched the movie history of yoga which was shown on 15th that that's right and that's really nice to see this so uh, we had this whole yoga week planned at iit bombay for the first time so we started with this movie first time in iit bombay we had summer school of yoga which is still going on uh, the movie was shown we had protocol classes yoga thon classes and tomorrow is the day so all those who have not registered for yoga thon or for the common yoga protocol we've circulated an email please do register yourself and make your participation felt tomorrow you will really enjoy the experience all those who are on facebook can be a member of yogastha group to be updated about what new things are happening on the campus in this field hope you enjoyed the session by dr shirley tellis so i can make a pdf and put it on the facebook or those of you are who are interested in having it can just put a message and we can email it to you that is dr shirley tellis's email id so feel free to write to her with your queries and questions thank you very much